The Morris Arboretum of the University of Pennsylvania began as Compton, the private estate of a Quaker brother and sister. John Morris was born in 1847, and Lydia, his younger sister, was born in 1849. In 1887, the Morris siblings purchased 26 acres of farmland in the northwest corner of Philadelphia in the Chestnut Hill section, overlooking the Wissahickon Valley. Their large, late Victorian mansion was designed by a well-known Philadelphia architect, Theophilus P. Chandler, Jr., and commanded a view in all directions. Some of his other buildings included the North Philadelphia train station, St. Asaph's Church in Bala Kenwood, and many of the original Philadelphia Zoo structures, including the Bear Pits, which survived until 1977. Compton also included a three-level carriage house with horse stables, which today is being used as the Widener Visitor Center. On the lower level of the Visitor Center, there is a historical display about the history of the Morrises and some artifacts from the mansion, which was torn down in 1968. You can also see some of the Mercer tiles, which were part of the original decoration of the carriage house. Between 1892 and 1910, the Morrises continued to purchase other adjacent parcels of land on the Philadelphia side of Northwestern Avenue. The last purchase in 1913 on the Montgomery County side within Springfield Township was called Bloomfield Farm and it included Springfield Mills, a grist mill, which dated back to 1761. The Wissahickon Creek is a significant aspect of the Morris Estate. Meandering through the White Marsh Valley, the Wissahickon is a pleasant, unremarkable stream which begins its 23-mile journey from a spring in a parking lot at the Montgomery Mall and meanders through Montgomery County. It flows along the western boundary of Bloomfield Farm and then forms the border of the Morris's estate. A few feet into Philadelphia, it begins to dramatically change as the pastoral limestone of the White Marsh Valley confronts the sterner rocks of the Wissahickon Formation. The landscape is transformed, and for the next seven miles, the creek drops through a steep, wooded, rocky gorge before finally emptying into the Schuylkill River between Maniunk and East Falls. With the creation of Fairmount Park in 1868, Chestnut Hill became a summer resort for wealthy Philadelphians who built homes where they could appreciate the sylvan settings and cool breezes. The favored sites were on the top of the escarpment overlooking the gorge. John and Lydia built Compton on one of those sites. Previously, John and Lydia's summer home was Cedar Grove, originally located in the Harrogate Frankfurt section of Philadelphia. As the children of a prominent Philadelphia Quaker couple, Isaac Pascal Morris and Rebecca Thompson Morris, they lived at 826 Pine Street, near the current location of Pennsylvania Hospital, and spent their summers at Cedar Grove. In 1927, Cedar Grove and its contents was donated to the Philadelphia Museum of Art by Lydia Morris and was moved to its current location in Fairmount Park, not too far from the Please Touch Museum. Lydia was very involved in the move and in the placement of all the Morris family artifacts. It is normally open for guided tours. John graduated from Haverford College with an engineering degree and went to work for his father's firm, I.P. Morris & Company. They manufactured industrial components such as iron furnaces, water pumps, and parts for large engines. In 1881, with the sale of the company to Cramp Shipworks, John had amassed enough wealth to retire. As the area around their summer home, Cedar Grove, became too industrialized, John and Lydia began looking for property where they could build a summer home and incorporate many of the ideas and features they had seen on their travels, as well as to complete their vision for an eventual public garden 
and educational institution. John and Lydia both held strong beliefs regarding stewardship and land preservation. While neither married, both John and Lydia were active, involved members of their community. John served on the city committee for the Centennial Exposition of 1876. He was also the chairman of the city committee for the Wissahickon Park Extension, earning him the nickname Champion of Parks and Playgrounds. Lydia was also very active in the Colonial Dames and was instrumental in the rescue and preservation of the Valley Green Inn as well as the Stenton Mansion. Both John and Lydia were collectors of art and craft objects from around the world that enriched their home and garden, which eventually were donated to the Philadelphia Museum of Art and the University of Pennsylvania Museum. They spent considerable time traveling overseas. On their first trip in 1881, they visited England, France, and Italy. Their second trip in 1889, shortly after their house was finished, took them around the world and lasted 11 months. In 1894, they toured Asia, which profoundly influenced their vision for their garden. They made additional trips, visiting England, France, and Italy again, as well as Spain, Russia, and Norway. They returned from each trip, eager to implement the ideas in their garden, eventually creating an American, Victorian, eclectic garden, specimen trees, formal garden elements, open lawns, and European and Japanese influences were brought together within a classic setting of an English romantic landscape. As you can see in this early photo, the spring house is visible along Hillcrest Avenue. This feature predates the Morrises, when some of the land was used as a dairy farm. The spring is fed by the East Brook, also known as the Hillcrest Run, a short tributary of the Wissahickon Creek, which begins from a spring behind Chestnut Hill Hospital on Norwood Avenue. It enters the Arboretum after flowing under Hillcrest Avenue, and seven bridges cross the brook within the Arboretum, and even a set of stepping stones that's a favorite place on a hot summer day. The earliest garden feature to be completed in 1891 at Compton was the Japanese tea house. It was shipped from Japan and built on site. Lydia would entertain guests and serve tea. It survived until 1954 when it was destroyed by Hurricane Hazel. Today, the Japanese bill stands close to that location, and the remaining stonework is visible as part of our outdoor classroom. Another early feature before 1900 was the orange balustrade. The design was described as an Italian garden villa. The balustrade, terrace, and rustic rock waterfall and hillside garden are elements copied from Italian Renaissance landscape. The orange-brown Acer Grissium, as well as some bonfire sugar maples, which have bright orange fall foliage, really rev up the hillside. One of John Morris's dreams to build a specialized greenhouse called a fernery was completed in 1899. He designed it himself with curved glass panes. The first company to receive his sketches said it couldn't be done, so he hired their competitor who built the fernery according to his original plans. Today, it is the only remaining freestanding Victorian estate fernery in North America. It houses over 200 varieties of ferns. Although the structure of the fernery is of Victorian origin, the placement of the stonework inside is a classic Japanese water garden created by Japanese craftsmen. They designed a vision from the overlook, valley with waterfalls, a pond with koi, winding paths, a rustic bridge, and a cave-like grotto. The native Wissahickon schist rocks are placed vertically in the classic Japanese fashion. Next building project at Compton was the Gardener's Cottage. It's located on the edge of the Arboretum right near Hillcrest Avenue. It currently is housing for the interns. 
The Swan Pond was designed and installed in 1905 by John Morris and a Japanese landscape designer, Mr. Y. Muto. The Swan Pond is an artificial lake created by damming the East Brook. The classical temple reflected at the water's edge is sculpted of white marble and modeled after the plans of Vitruvius, a student of architecture during the reign of Emperor Augustus. The pond has a tendency to silt up, and over the years, dredging operations had to be completed in the Swan Pond. The first set of swans in 1905 were named Lohengrin and Elsa. Lohengrin and Elsa were the names of the characters in Richard Wagner's opera of 1850. These swans were a gift from the Canadian government on the 300th anniversary of the founding of the Pennsylvania Colony in 1982. However, The pond was too shallow for the swans to swim, so a major dredging operation had to take place before the Arboretum could accept the swans. About two years ago, during a real cold snap, the pond was almost frozen over except for a small area around the bubblers. The Arboretum staff removed the swans for safekeeping after they noticed coyote tracks in the snow on the top of the ice. Our current mute swan pair are sisters named Flora and Fauna. Stop by and say hello, but don't feed them. Their favorite meal is organic spring mix and romaine lettuce provided daily by our swan keeper. John and Lydia Morris were most likely influenced by the writings of Capability Brown, who had a major influence on English landscapes, and Andrew Jackson Downing, whose book, The Architecture of Country Houses, published in 1850, both suggested damming the stream to create a lake or a pond to bring continual seasonal interest to the landscape for all to enjoy. Look to the right in this next photo. Japanese gardener Y. Muto built this garden for John Morris in 1905. He made the hills with the soil dug from the swan pond that was built at the same time. This Japanese hill and water garden contains the essential elements found in a Japanese garden. You will find hills, bridges, rocks, water, plants, trees, paths, lanterns, and shrines. This area is home to many cut leaf Japanese maples, as well as a beautiful echianthus plant, which turns a marvelous red in the fall. It's an area not to be missed. Like other privileged Victorians, John and Lydia Morris were intrepid travelers. Many of their garden features were inspired by the places that they visited. For example, the Long Fountain. After visiting the Alhambra in Spain, they were motivated to install a Moorish fountain. The Long Fountain has become a favorite destination for the youngest Arboretum visitors who delight in touching the dancing water. Another favorite destination for our young visitors is the log cabin, which was designed by John Morris as a private retreat for his sister Lydia. It is located on the banks of the East Brook, downstream from the Swan Pond. The log cabin was used by the Morrises to entertain friends, and Lydia spent many hours on the porch enjoying the view of the stream and woodlands. Remember, this was before air conditioning. Constructed of eastern hemlock logs and a river stone cobbled chimney, the cabin was reminiscent of an Adirondack style cabin where the Morrises vacationed frequently. Although rustic in appearance from the outside, the inside was well furnished with antiques and Lydia loved to serve tea to her friends. At the time of its construction in 1908, the pump house was an integral feature of the Morris' estate. Its wheel powered a three-cylinder pump, which pushed water uphill to a cistern in the tower of the former Compton Mansion. It also provided water for grazing livestock, and it was used to send water up to the hill to the garden's fountains. It was located along the tributary to the Wissagon Creek, the paper mill run, 
the second tributary which crosses the Mars Arboretum. The Oak LA was planted shortly after the parcel of land was acquired in 1905. It consisted of over 100 oak trees of just about the same size, and they were evenly spaced. However, in 1992, a tornado ripped through the area and destroyed most of the oak trees. It was replanted with Schumard oaks and a variety of other plants and shrubs, like crepe myrtles and oak leaf hydrangeas, to provide interest in all seasons of the year. At the end of the alley, you will see a sculpture called Three Tubes. It provides a visual puzzle. Let's see if you can figure it out. You can also stop for a little rest in the middle of the alley on a lovely bench and enjoy the decorative tiles. John Morris purchased the land for the English Park in 1909. In keeping with English landscape design traditions, the area provides a wide open lawn and long vistas of the surrounding landscape. The English Park is marked by gentle rolling lawns bordered by significant collections of maples, witch hazels, dogwoods, cherries, and stewardias. The Seven Arches Balustrade was built originally to serve as a tool shed and a pump house for the water needed for the fountains and other water features. The key fountain located at the bottom of the English meadow combines two distinct styles. The top is reminiscent of a medieval Moorish palace of Spain and the bottom style is of a Victorian rock garden. Water for the fountain originally came from a cistern close to the seven arches at the top of the English meadow. In Lydia Morris's time, there was a cantilever bridge over the key fountain. She often would have her chauffeur drive her in her Pierce arrow around the garden each day so she could view and enjoy the changes that were occurring. The garden steps, wall, and seat, now referred to as Lydia's seat, was built in the hillside in the north end of the Rose Garden. The seat and stairs were a favorite garden approach from Compton Mansion to what was then a mixed flower kitchen and herb garden. Today, nestled among the base of it are many different hosta varieties. You can also look to the right and head down a hidden path to the Camellia Walk. Halfway down the path, stop and look at the huge tulip tree on the left side, which was dating back to the Morris's time. On the right side is a yew with smooth reddish bark. It was planted in the mid-1940s. This is actually a shrub that has matured so much that it has major limbs and multiple trunks. The Japanese Overlook Garden, completed in 1912, was a collaborative effort between Waimuto and John Morris's Q-trained gardener, Frank Gould. The original intent of the Overlook Garden, which included views of the mansion and the arboretum, is now somewhat obscure due to the mature growth of the trees surrounding the observation point. Large Fudoseki stones are placed prominently throughout the garden and on its perimeter, including one with carved monkeys that seem to say, see, hear, and speak no evil. A pair of stone Korean dogs stand prominently in the garden. Notice one is smiling and one is not. In 1913, the Mercury Loggia was constructed by John Morris to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the building of Compton. The Loggia is a small temple-like structure constructed of Wissahick and Schist with an arched plaster roof and mosaic tile floor. Located on the western edge of the English Park, the loggia captures the feeling of a Roman temple. Inside the loggia is a bronze statue of Mercury, recognizable by his winged sandals. The grotto beneath the loggia is an artificial cavern lined with wissahick and schist. It's a cool place to spend a hot summer day. Originally, an artificial stream bed was created to allow water to flow through the ravine garden and collect in a pool at the end of the path. The slope sides of the ravine are studded with large stones that serve to anchor the soil 
and accent flowering bulbs and perennials. At the end of the ravine paths is one of the first three Acer Grissium specimens brought to the United States in 1901 by E. H. Wilson from his first expedition in China in 1899. John Morris died unexpectedly of kidney failure in 1915 while vacationing in the Adirondacks. The step fountain in the center of English Park was commissioned by Lydia to honor her brother John. The fountain faced the mansion and could have been easily viewed from the windows of Compton. The step fountain, done in the Beaux-Arts style, was an idea from a fountain they might have seen in St. Petersburg, Russia. Although it is hardly hidden, many visitors view it only from a distance and therefore miss one of its delightful features. Listen and notice how the sound of the water changes as you walk up or down the steps. The bronze sculpture after B.K.S. Iyengar by American artist Robert Engman sits at the top of the step fountain. It has an unusual quality. When it's viewed from different vantage points, it seems to change shape and looks like a different sculpture. You can see triangles, circles, and diamonds. The mixed garden area became mainly a rose garden in 1924 when Lydia moved here permanently at the age of 75. She made a few changes in this area by building a rock wall with elegant stone steps into the rose garden. The six foot high rock wall is made of Wissahickon schist. Its sunny south facing location is perfect for alpine plants and succulents and many other varieties. The rose garden today contains a mix of roses, perennials, annuals, and woody plants with height elements and garden ornaments, a medicinal and herb garden with an informal design in contrast to the conformity of the rose garden is located at the lower entrance. The summer house with its recently redesigned plaza is an elegant destination in the corner of the rose garden. It is topped with an interesting weather vane designed by Lydia herself. It depicts Lydia, her gardener, and favorite pets enjoying the garden. Today the Arboretum's natural areas in the lower meadows look almost as they did when the property was the Morris's estate. In the early 1900s, John Morris installed a tile field to drain the wet meadow in order to raise cattle. Beef cattle grazed here during World War II to supply the war effort. The plan for the wetland included both shallow areas as well as several deep holes to accommodate overwintering of fish and amphibians. To encourage birds, waterfowl, and mammals to inhabit the area, bluebird, kestrel, wood docks, and bat boxes were installed. The Arboretum's wetland is now a thriving example of an ecosystem that supports an abundance of native plant life as well as year-round and migratory bird populations. In 2009, a new exhibit called Tree Adventure featuring the Out on a Limb Canopy Walk opened at the Arboretum. The centerpiece of the exhibit is a 450-foot-long walkway that soars 50 feet above the ground, giving visitors a bird's-eye view of the forest. This exhibit is wildly popular with children of all ages. Visitors can cross a suspension bridge to a giant bird's nest or scamper onto the squirrel scramble rope netting between two towering trees, or head to the top of the Wissahickon Vista platform for sweeping views of the surrounding Wissahickon Gorge. The Garden Railway is a miniature bustling world set within the splendor of a summer garden. Colorful trains meander around historic scale model buildings such as City Hall, the Art Museum, and Betsy Ross House. The buildings are created entirely of natural materials each detailed with leaves, bark, vines, and twigs. The Garden Railway display is open during the summer months and returns annually on Thanksgiving weekend for the holidays. Twinkling lights and festive decorations have made the display a very popular holiday destination for families. 
Lydia Morris died in 1932. She is buried in the family plot in Laurel Hill Cemetery. In her will, she bequeathed Compton to the University of Pennsylvania to be used as an educational and botanical research facility. In John's will 17 years prior, he stated that Compton be a place where young men and possibly women may be taught practical gardening and horticulture. Kudos to John. He was a man before his time. The estate was left in trust to the University of Pennsylvania and valued at $4 million. Eighteen months after Lydia's death, the garden was open to visitors, and almost 10,000 visitors enjoyed the garden on that first day. Once the Arboretum became part of the University of Pennsylvania, the focus shifted from that of an aesthetic landscape garden to more of a research and collection-based Arboretum for close to 40 years. The 1970s were a time of great change and progress at the Arboretum. In 1978, it was listed in the National Register of Historic Places. In 1988, it became the official Arboretum of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. One of the most outstanding features of the Arboretum is its collection of large and beautiful trees. When John and Lydia first purchased the property, it was almost completely devoid of trees. The Morrises also established long-term professional friendships with the leading horticulturalists and plant collectors of their time. Charles Sargent, director of the Arnold Arboretum, plant explorer David Fairchild, and E.H. Wilson, the famous plant collector. Many of the plants brought back during these early expeditions were shared by the Morris Estate, the Arnold Arboretum, and the Biltmore Estate in North Carolina. New England proved too cold and North Carolina too hot. By the 1970s, it was only the Morris Arboretum that could proudly display over 100 trees collected in Northeast Asia by E.H. Wilson. Today, the Morris's legacy is sustained by careful maintenance and management of these mature trees. At this time, I will present photos of some of the notable trees in the Arboretum collection. I'll begin with the signature tree of the Arboretum, a champion tree, the Ketsura tree, planted by the Morrises in 1902 as part of their Japanese garden. It is one of the largest trees of its kind in North America. It starts in the spring with leaves that look a little bit pink, but in the fall the leaves turn a golden yellow and the decaying leaves emit an odor like cotton candy. The next tree I'd like to highlight is the Dawn Redwood. We have a grove of them located along the East Brook. Dawn Redwoods were thought to be extinct here in North America. We could only find fossil remains. But in the 1940s, in a remote area of China, a grove was discovered. These deciduous conifers created quite a sensation among botanical circles. The Arboretum was one of the first to receive some seeds. We have two specimens right near the swan pond. They exhibit beautiful russet gold fall color, and this grove is thriving near the East Brook. A school tour once asked a fellow guide, why do your trees all have credit cards? Here's what our tags look like. They contain lots of pertinent information, so don't forget to search them out when you visit. In the next section of the program, I will be identifying plants and trees with labels and also providing a musical interlude as this program winds down.
There are several important Morris legacies. Their estate became a public institution and helped to preserve a portion of the Wissahickon Creek and its tributaries. Their commitment to providing educational facilities and programs about temperate deciduous forests has evolved into a significant national and international resource. In keeping with the vision of John and Lydia Morris, the Arboretum promotes an understanding of the relationship between plants, people, and place through its multifaceted programs. Just as the Morrises recognized long ago, plants and people depend on each other for survival. <laughs>